I joined the military halfway through my senior year of high school, wanting to serve my country. The Coast Guard said that they could get me in within a month, so it shit me off. I loved that I could keep up with the guys and work as hard as they did. The professionalism, the camaraderie. Getting out there and giving it my all. That's what I chose to do. Everything changed the day that I was raped. I've never seen trauma like I've seen from veterans who have suffered military sexual trauma. This goes everywhere with me. You always have protection with Jesus, but sometimes you need just a little bit more. Most Americans assume there is access to a system of justice. You'd see a guy get five years for drugs and two weeks for rape. They let this man get away with everything but murder. They gave him Military Professional of the Year Award during the rape investigation. It was a laughing matter. He says, you're the third girl to report rape this week. You guys like all in cahoots? You think this is a game? About half a million women have now been sexually assaulted in the US military. Civilians see it as being a military problem. Anybody can be a victim of sexual assault. Rapists are repetitive criminals. Why would they stop? They go on to literally prey on women and men, girls and boys in our neighborhoods back home. It's very difficult to do a story on the most powerful institution in the world. The Department of Defense has a history of covering up sexual offense problems. I don't know who you think elected you to defy the Congress of the United States. What is it you're trying to hide? Someone once said that all great journeys began with one step. In 2004, as a second year graduate student, I walked into a room full of women, and I didn't know then that it would change my life. My name is Dr. Malia Sharvat. I am the clinical director for the Artemis Rising Invisible War Recovery Program, which is a free community-based program that provides treatment for veterans who suffer from post-traumatic conditions related to military sexual trauma. That room in 2004 was a group of women who had all experienced MST and that group of women taught me so much about their experiences and in many ways as much as the film led to the founding of the program that I now work with. So I'm here today with two amazing women, Victoria Sanders and Katie Weber, both of whom are veterans of the United States Army and both of whom experienced military sexual trauma during their service. They are going to tell us a little bit about their experiences of serving in the military, as well as their journey tor toward their recovery and healing from their experiences. And I would just like to invite Victoria to begin by telling us a little bit about herself. Um, I'm a grandmother of one and a mother of two. I uh, served in the military in 1975 in the U.S. Army. I was uh, 30 days at my first post at Fort Carson when I was assaulted by a sergeant that worked next door. I uh, was lucky because my boss found me afterwards and uh, called the MPs, which started a paper trail and made it possible for me to get my VA claim approved. It was a long and arduous process but it started in 2004, and I was one of the women in that room with, that Malia walked into. Um, we were five women who wanted to um, have therapy, but we couldn't fit into the model that was current at the VA. So we said, okay, let's start a process group, and, and our doctor was very kind and took some heat for it, but she went ahead and processed us and gave us cognitive behavioral therapy that made it for, for me possible to say for the first time in my life, I did not cause my rape. My claim of when I met Malia, I was in the process of writing my uh, impact statement and that process took a year. So even when I first met her, I was as shut down as anyone could be. But now um, this year I've come out of the closet, so to speak, in as far as MST, and it's been a very fruitful enterprise and has done a lot towards helping me heal. Yeah, and Katie, um, I know that you have a lot of experience speaking publicly mm -hmm. and have done a tremendous amount of advocacy both in the community and also on the Hill in Washington, D.C. So um, could you just tell us a little bit about how you ended up being such an advocate for this? Because um, 
that's very difficult to do, to be so public about something that is so private and personal. So I guess, well, my story started um, when I got a phone call from a producer, uh, a filmmaker named Kirby Dick. And when I got that message, I was like, goodness gracious, what could this possibly be about? Because, I mean, <laughs> I've, I've had a lot happen in my life, and I was so grateful to go Google his name and see the other films he had made, and I thought, wow, what a class act. Um, I saw another film he had done, and so I thought, yeah, I want to be a part of this project regarding military sexual trauma, where they really just wanted to tell the truth, you know? And... Um, so we interviewed a few times before they came to my house and I ended up being a part of the film and a part of the movement. And uh, the film has really made it possible for myself and so many other uh, military rape survivors um, be able to explain to our families um, by utilizing this, this film. Um, and then I did this not thinking I was getting anything back except for maybe some justice in the future for the other men and women who might be raped until we can fix this. And so pretty much I told the filmmakers everything and um, I saw that movie and I thought, thank goodness I was only in a little part because I wanted to do the advocacy part. I like to talk to people and it's just a conversation I keep telling myself. And that's what gets me to every like event is yes, I am a military sexual trauma survivor, but I'm not in victim mode anymore. Like I'm in recovery and um, I've been in recovery for, you know, ever since I recognized that I was substance abusing because my PTSD was out of control and the VA was enabling it. And so I was addicted to pain, opiate pain medication and I decided to get clean and sober. And as an MST survivor and 100% service connected veteran who was addicted to prescription medications, the VA was not providing me anywhere to go. There was nowhere for me to get clean off of those meds. And um, so needless to say, I found a women's trauma recovery program that is no longer there. And um, I got to go there and at least get sober. And then uh, I didn't get lucky enough to really get some awesome treatment and let some of the, I say I left my rucksack up there, you know, where we, where I went to the 14 day program for Artemis and Invisible War. Um, so I got to go through, through that program, um, fully paid for. I didn't pay for anything. They flew my husband out to, to meet me and um, learn quickly uh, my new coping strategies. And so he could maybe, you know, be inspired to do something for himself, but also to push me to continue using those coping skills. And um, it was really awesome to have my husband on board for that. And I could have never afforded you know, I really could have never been able to do, I would have never been able to do that. So um, I, I can only just say that since um, J uh, February, I went through the program in February of this year. And so, I mean, I can't even do the math. How many months is that? Like seven, six, mm -hmm. eight, eight. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> well, I could tell you that I, um, I was a, a, a lacking confidence and I, like Victoria had said, and I'm so grateful that for her, she met Malia 10 years earlier and she was able to find that self-forgiveness because for me, uh, no matter how many years I've spent in the VA system doing outpatient therapy for PTSD, um, I never forgave myself or went over the trauma itself mm -hmm. with someone that was safe mm -hmm. that I could let out what I wasn't allowed to do because when I was raped and I reported it, I didn't have support of my peers and I didn't have my chain of command support and I didn't have MPs to report to and there were all excuses why I couldn't talk to someone of um, you know sure. someone to do something I was hoping I could have a big brother or a dad you know of someone paternal say oh my gosh this happened to you who did this and it didn't happen like that and it was heartbreaking and it took me 15 years to realize that I haven't done anything wrong and the program taught me that with the new coping skills I have, I've been able to come home and I like, I can do massage therapy and le I let someone touch me, you know what I mean? And that's a huge thing for a rape survivor is to let someone else in. And I was allowed to do that in a trusted environment and that was surrounded by you guys, you know, doctors. So if there was a problem with the, with the massage therapist, you were right there. And that's what I think was the gift is knowing that you guys were there for us 24-7 for 14 days straight. 
And if anyone was having a midnight meltdown, you guys were there. And that's so important. And keeping the group small is also so vital. I think the intimacy that we got from the group was awesome because we all commiserated and at the same time grew. It's just, I just, I feel it was such a gift in my life and I'm super grateful and um, I, I want to go back. <laughs> so the model, um, the model for the program that Katie was talking about is actually um, something I just want to describe briefly. So it's psychotherapy based. Um, the trauma treatment per se, the modality is um, EMDR, which is a very well validated treatment for post-traumatic stress. Um, but it's layered with many complementary therapies. So what we do is, um, and all of this is free to the veterans, the travel, everything's taken care of, all of their costs. Um, we bring them to our facility. We have a beautiful facility, a retreat in Virginia. It's private, it's beautiful, it's in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains. And um, the Appalachian Trail runs right through it. I mean, it's, it's just a stunning place to be, um, peaceful and yoga therapy, acupuncture, physical exercise, diet and nutrition. You check out from the internet, so no phones, no computers. This is really a retreat with a true focus on mind-body healing. Um, I really listened. I actually kept a notebook and I took notes over the years about what what people were telling me they needed. And so when I got an opportunity with this amazing group of women, Regina Kulik-Scully, who funded this program, Amy Zering, who thought of doing it, who was the producer of the movie, um, to really be part of creating really a Cadillac, so something that is um, that addresses all of these different components. And so I think what I would ask you first, Victoria, to talk about is what you have found helpful in your recovery, what you have found not so helpful. Um, because I think for other veterans thinking about coming to something like this, it can be very scary and to just to kind of think about what works and what hasn't worked. Well, what Dr. Brevard put us through was cognitive behavioral therapy where we challenged our thinking and it was an intense process and normally it was only done at the inpatient program in Menlo Park, but she put it forth and we grabbed it because we were hungry for something. We needed something to help us feel better about the situation because the talk therapy and the um, groups for, you know, just basic skills that they teach over and over again were not helping us any longer. We'd all reached a saturation point of we can't hear how to be mindful anymore. We, our mind is too busy. And for all of the people that were in that program, I've kept in touch with all of them. Um, they've all been able to progress in some way. Uh, we each, you know, were at a separate place, at a different place, and um, after the group was finished, we stayed in contact with each other. One of the women was Native American. She took me to sweat lodges. That was phenomenal. It was really something that you know, helped us to get in touch with ourselves. It's very hard to not be mindful when you're in a sweat lodge. <laughs> um, but that was actually on the Menlo Park campus. And, uh, but not something that the VA said here, it was something that I discovered. Um, the other things that did not work for me is, as I said, hearing the same coping skills over and over. I know how to be mindful. I did yoga when I was 18 before I ever joined the military. You know, it, the things that they were teaching me, I had used from the time I was assaulted in 1975 to the time I entered the VA system in 2004. And I'd gone through nursing school, I'd had children, and you know, I had coped, I had attempted suicide at one point, and that kind of was a red flag, but I just troopered on until one day a woman was raped right outside my apartment, basically, and I just lost track of myself. Yeah. And, and that's when I entered the VA, I got aggressive treatment. I got treated immediately by highly trained people who understood the, the problem of MST and PTSD and all of the things that surround that 
people did stuff for me, I was the luckiest person in the world because they did stuff for me. They got me appointments with people. They pulled things out of the air and made it possible for me to even be here today. I, I've heard so many stories of how difficult it is to get into the VA and to get into a good provider and I just got lucky. I mean, I, I look at my life and I say, my God, I have been one of the luckiest people alive. It took me 28 years to develop PTSD to the point of not being able to emotionally cope with even getting food for myself. That's how bad it was. I was locked in my apartment and by the time I met Malia, I had already seen a few people, but not anyone that had any great answers. And this cognitive behavioral therapy where you actually say, here's what I think, and you go through a process to figure out, why do I think that? What would make me think that? Why would anyone think that? And you just step by step, and it takes weeks, and it takes hard, hard work. And you only get out of it as much as you put into it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the, the folks that took apart the San Jose Clinic did not understand how aggressive and uh, helpful the people were there. So a lot of veterans don't seek care. In fact, um, a recent study showed that the average number of visits to VA mental health care for veterans is one. They come one time. And they never come back. So, you know, for the folks that are watching us talk about this and sitting there in their home with us inside of them, right, struggling mm -hmm. with whether it's their post-combat traumatic reaction or their post-sexual trauma um, reaction. Um, and PTSD is just one of many ways that people can respond to trauma. I mean, people get depressed, they become agoraphobic. There's a lot of things that happen. Katie, to those men and women who are suffering and are scared of reaching out for help, what would you what would you say to them in terms of of what recovery is meant to you and encouraging encouraging them to to keep trying? Mm -hmm. um, well, like one of the more recent um, tools that I've used is. Um, I told myself that until I've tried everything, I am never allowed to just check out of this earth. You know, I've said to myself, until I've tried everything. Well, if I haven't been to India, or I haven't, you know, gone back to Germany, then I haven't done everything. So I have this bucket list and it's, it's insatiable. So we have ways of containing our feelings and um, it's been really cool in the last couple of years to go from being a veteran in the VA system, feeling like the only woman in the waiting room, and I didn't ever see a similar female face except for the women that worked there. And they knew me when I was so unwell. I mean, really, when I was yelling at staff. I mean, I was off the chain, and I didn't even have an idea of why. Um, and so now that I see that staff, when I, when I meet a new woman veteran in my community, and I want them to feel comfortable about going to the VA to get help because they, ha they have helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. And especially now that I've gone through the program, coming back into the VA system, I've told them what worked for me. And now they're amending. I'm doing EMDR with my Great. VA therapist. I mean, Great. it's like, yeah, can we process that? I mean, it's like, that's actually an option. Processing something was never an option for me before. So I felt like I was sort of a hard drive and that I was already full. And I had all, I had no more memory left. And what I did at, at Artemis was I feel like I dropped my rucksack and I, I made new room in my hard drive. And now I have some new coping skills and there are some things I needed to acknowledge that you guys helped me acknowledge, like, uh, for example, my immaturity and how it might relate to the time I was raped. So I was 18 when I was assaulted. Mm -hmm. And pretty much now that I'm a mom and I have children who are teenagers and stuff, it's kind of weird, but I've finally recognized and looked in the mirror, yes, I am immature. And there's a, stati there's a reason for it, there's a diagnosis about it, and I don't have any shame about it anymore. Yeah. So I, I like to be fun and playful with my kids and my friends and keep things as light as possible. And I have had to learn boundaries with, um, you know, um, who I bring into my life. And um, I've had to learn to love again. And I'm still working on intimacy, you know. But um, I couldn't do those things at the VA. Now I kind of have everything kind of pulled back. And I'm in a peaceful place. And I know how to get centered again. And that's been huge for me, too, is being um, present 
organically like here mm -hmm. you know and um I work on that every day I'm my full-time job I mean, I knew both of you, actually, I knew both of you at different points in my life long before this stage in your recovery, and it's just, you look different. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I see you now, you both look so different, and um, and also, I mean, when I first encountered you, Victoria, you could hardly talk in group, and so now to see you testifying mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill in front of Congress, it's just such a powerful change. It was, sur it was surreal. I, I never dreamed in all of my life that that would ever happen. To me, I was pinching myself the entire time. Uh, my family uh, learned a newfound respect for me because I knew Malia and I saw her at a filming of a uh, showing of the film The Invisible War, and we ran into each other. And it was like I walked up to her and I said, "You went to this school and you went to that." And she looked She's at me. Freaking me out. She looked at me <laughs> like I was a stalker. Mm -hmm. And and then I said, "It's me." And she said, "Oh, I never thought it would be you, Victoria Sanders." And I said. Well, I didn't even pay attention to who the name was that they gave me. And it was just, uh, it, it really, I did that, we did that on the Monday before I testified in Washington on That's Friday. Yeah. And it was just the boost that I needed yeah. to, to really go in there and say, hey, this is what good therapy can do. It can produce people who are excited about helping the veterans become whole again. I don't know that I'll ever get to that day when I say I'm completely whole, but I know that my family, my friends have all seen a change in me, mm -hmm. and part of that change came from me being able to stand up and speak out and go to Congress. God, I wish everyone could go to Congress. It was the best therapy I've had in years because I had to think about what I had to say, and I only had five minutes. And if you've got five minutes to tell the nation what you think, you really have to think hard. And meeting Malia that day made me get on the plane and start changing the whole thing. Okay, we've got to include Malia in this because that's really the story. The story is patients can be powerful when they are given the right therapy. Mm -hmm. Do you have to go to back to where your trauma was and what were your dreams then? And then you have to basically make a timeline like we did yeah. and go through and really acknowledge that, you know, just, you know, in the VA system, no one would ever feel comfortable going over a timeline. And I'll tell you why. If you admit that your parents divorced at eight and it broke your heart, <laughs> you know, and you got started getting bad grades and then you ended up in continuation school or whatever, you have a fear inside that they're going to hold that against you and not really consider you a veteran. For and your that claim. Take, yeah. And so veterans have a very uh, difficult time going in and being very honest with their caregivers. And I've noticed a huge change in that, especially in the last five years. But more importantly, the fact that the VA has an MST coordinator now mm -hmm. and that when you call a VA clinic and you say, may I speak to the MST coordinator, they actually know who the that MST is. coordinator is. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, progress, you know, not perfection, but progress. And I think you having been in the VA system gives you such a great perception of what we've gone through. I would say that for anyone out there that's sitting at home afraid like I was, the first call I made was to the vet center. Mm -hmm. And Good call. vet mm -hmm. centers, um, they vary they from records, county, right? county to county, state to state, but they can start you on the process. And if it were not for the vet center in Santa Rosa or in Rona Park, and the vet center in San Jose, I would not be sitting at this table today. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. I can really say that. And I actually can say that I've heard that from so many veterans, that the vet centers are a great point of entry. The social workers who are there, the staff, are wonderful. Unlike the VA, they don't keep the same kind of medical records. For a lot they of don't people, write down what you're wearing. Right. For a lot of people, it's a softer landing, mm -hmm. as I say. It's a, it's a way to come in in an environment that's a little less bureaucratic and structured than the VA. But I feel I'm just a catalyst. You know, you, you, you remember were. chemistry, right? You remember yes. chemistry class? So the chemicals are in the thing, and you just pour, you pour a catalyst in, and it causes a reaction. But the catalyst is just one element. There's a lot of other stuff going on, and that's kind of how I, I feel about myself in relationship to the work you guys have done. Mm -hmm. And so, again, um, just so everyone knows, um, if you want information about our program at Artemis Rising Invisible War, you can go to www.notinvisible.org, and there's a page for the recovery program. 
Um, again, just to reiterate, we are a community funded program for veterans. So we don't receive funding from the VA or federal sources of any kind. 100% of the money to provide this free treatment comes from private donors. Um, and it ranges from Regina Kulik Scully, our founding donor, who gave uh, millions of dollars for this effort, down to men and women who log onto our website and give $20. And $20 will pay for an acupuncture session for a veteran. So, you know, nothing is too small to make a difference in people's lives.